Uh, okay, so Jonathan Winter is Chief Engineer for BWXT's Advanced Technology Programs, where he's been working on nuclear thermal propulsion as well as other things. I can't wait to see his talk. So thank you very much, John. Well, thanks. Uh, good afternoon, I guess. Um, I am uh, Jonathan Winter. I'm the BWXT. I'm the Chief Engineer at the Advanced Technology Programs at BWXT. I'm currently serving as the Chief Engineer for the Nuclear Thermal Propulsion Game Changing Director at STMD Project, working with Mike Houts uh, at Marshall, primarily focused on the reactor conceptual design and then the fuel element and fuel production uh, parts of the NTP project. I was invited to speak uh, about the particle bed reactor, uh, kind of continuing the theme from James Powell, uh, Jim Powell this morning. Uh, and uh, then Roger Leonard will follow me and he'll probably have more information, better information, he'll correct what I, what I say here uh, as I pull some information from some historical data. Uh, a little bit of my background, I, I got my PhD at MIT at, a little bit after Mike uh, and I got, was working on nuclear thermal propulsion back then uh, and it did a little bit of work on the particle bed reactor work uh, at the time that it, after it became public in, in the early 90s. Uh, so we'll uh, move ahead to talk a little bit about what particle bed reactors are, uh, what the applications were, and maybe some future applications for it for, uh, for future missions or, or other, other uh, exploration uh, initiatives. Um, so it, a little storyline behind it. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, like we heard this morning, uh, it was, the concept was invented by uh, James Powell. Uh, and then in 1982, Grumman uh, at the time, uh, would now all these companies have kind of changed their names as they merged together and, and whatnot. But in 1982, Grumman committed personnel to, to work on the concept uh, and further develop it. So kind of like the conceptual development phase of, of the work. Uh, and then they were able to progress the design far enough along that ultimately in 1987, SDIO picked it up, and at the time, SP100 was going on, SDIO, Star Wars, so the late 80s was, it was a time frame of a lot of different space work and space fission, fission power systems were going on. But then there's also an interest in, in propulsion. And so SDIO picked it up with a Grumman-led industry team, and at that time, BWXT got on board to, to actually make the fuel, do the, do the reactor design for critical experiments, uh, that they performed at Sandia and picked up the aspect of building and assembling the, the reactor concept uh, and piece parts of it and doing testing uh, with a fairly large group of, of, of industry partners. Uh, then what the program sought to do is develop a lighter and smaller second generation particle bed reactor. Uh, uh, which became publicly announced in 1992. Up until that time, it was a dark project, and Roger knows the most about that because he was the program manager for, the, for that effort. In the early 90s, it came out as, as a public, public program uh, at the annual Space Nuclear Power and Propulsion Symposium in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, at that time then, uh, as things were happening with budgets and everything else, while the program was formally terminated in January, uh, they had made an awful lot of progress, both with the critical experiments to show that physics-wise it would work, uh, and then had done some uh, in-reactor and non-nuclear testing of, of the fuel elements and, and the fuel elements, making a pretty large leap in the ability to make smaller, super-compact reactor systems uh, that were well beyond what the NERVA capabilities were from the early 60s and 70s from the NERVA program. Um, so next, a little bit about how the system works. Uh, it's a fairly system, simple system. Any of the nuclear rocket engines only need to use a single monopropellant. So they only use hydrogen to get the highest molecular weight uh, for the systems. Uh, and the hotter you can make the gas, the higher the ISP you can have. You've got to keep yourself less than melting the fuel unless you go to a liquid liquid system or a gaseous core system that Mike showed a little some of those examples of uh, for the even higher ISP capable. So you're limited to the melting point of the fuel and what's the best way to get the highest gas temperature to the closest to the fuel temperature? You make particles that are really really small to increase the heat transfer area and the surface area to volume of it and pass the gas directly over the fuel particles. Uh, the rest of the system is just providing turbo machinery to pump, pump the gas through the, through the system. Uh, it, the flow path essentially comes to the liquid hydrogen tank, goes through the turbo machinery, uh, the pump, to pump it up to pressure. 
depending on whether or not you use an expander cycle or a bleed cycle, in this case it's showing a bleed cycle, uh, an expander cycle for things where you pass some of the, you pass the flow through the system first to pick up some heat to form the driving force for the turbine machinery. So going from B through the reactor system, portions of it to pick up some of the heat, primarily in this case it would have been to cool the moderators to make the system really small. Go on to the turbine machinery with that heat to point E and then come back through the reactor system to the fuel area and then pass through the nozzle to where you pick up the most heat from the system. And it'll look, so you start off from cryogenic temperatures at around 50 PSI through the turbo pump getting up to more than 2,500 PSI, uh, picking up heat in different places to drive the turbine machinery and ultimately having a chamber pressure somewhere around 1,000 PSI and temperatures of the gas that would be 5,400 ranking or about 3,000 Kelvin uh, to get an ISP of somewhere around 1,000 seconds uh, for, for the system. Uh, so comparisons of how P, the particle bed reactors were different than NERVA derivatives, the, at the end of the NERVA program in 1972, they were able to, like Mike showed, they, they tested 20 reactors in the, in the desert in Nevada. Uh, versus various breadboarding up through engine kind of configurations. But they were able to achieve specific impulses of 850 seconds uh, with that, with gas temperatures of somewhere around 2600 Kelvin, which is about the, what those fuel elements could manage without, without melting the fuel or, or further erosion of them. They could have thrust to weight ratios of somewhere around four to one or eight to one, depending on the thrust level. Most of them were targeting a single engine application of about 75,000 pounds to 100,000 pounds thrust. The one test that Mike should have talked about with the 4,000, 4,600 megawatts, which is bigger than a commercial power plant in a reactor that's less than a meter wide and a meter tall, that one was a 250,000 pound thrust engine. Uh, at 4,600 megawatts, uh, and they plan to go up to 5,000 megawatts with that system. But most of the most of the designs for for the reactor and flight test for any of the Mars missions, they were planning on a on a single engine, 75,000 pound thrust engine, which is about 1,500 megawatts, which is still a lot of a lot of power. For the particle bed reactor, they're looking at specific impulses of 1,000. So chemical rockets, you get about 450. Nerva was getting 850, about double. And then we add on another 20% by using a particle bed reactor to have that very small heat transfer length to get the heat out of the fuel into the gas. And so we had had no nozzle chamber gas temperatures of around 3,000 Kelvin. You can get very high thrust to weight because it's a very small, compact system. With, you don't have a lot of structural material in there, so you can make the system really, really small and get super high thrust to weight ratios, which, which come to an advantage if you want to use it for other, other things uh, or, or building out your vehicle. You, you, it gets back to that delta M giving you higher, higher delta V capabilities. And, and some of the designs kind of settled in on um, a series of the reports, somewhere around a 40,000 pound thrust engine or about 1,000 megawatts uh, with that and, and targeting well above 900 seconds uh, for, for the particle bed reactor. And so the way that it works is you can get a very high core power density uh, targeting double or three times the amount of what a NERVA engine could do at, at somewhere 20 megawatts per liter it's 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 pretty pretty high power density and therefore for a thousand megawatts you can make a very small system but it's all based on having a a, a particle a coated particle so developing like the high temperature gas reactor particles able to made out of uranium carbide zerk carbide coatings to contain fission products and provide different barriers for the structure to keep it structurally sound for it not to crack apart and stuff under its operations and then slipped into an annular annular uh, fuel element, and I think the, the length might have been anywhere from like two, two feet to maybe three feet in length at the most. Um, and the flow would flow radially across the fuel, across the pack bed to, to limit the pressure drop, flow through the, through the fuel region, across the bed of particles, and then out the exhaust, where it would pick up it going from uh, picking up about 3,000 Kelvin, well, 2,500 Kelvin across that about one inch of, of length of particle bed. So you're picking up a very high delta T across, across the fuel there. It's surrounded by moderator elements, which are used to slow the neutrons down, to provide the best fission cross-section, 
Uh, do you want to slow the neutrons down so that they stay within the system and most of them will then interact with the U-235? Uh, this would have been a high enriched system uh, to make it so that you could have a very compact, highest, highest fuel loading density. Graphite and stuff have very low neutron cross section, so again, not a lot of structural material in there to absorb neutrons. Everything is going to go to the U-235, so you can make a small compact system with moderator, in this case either lithium hydride or zerk hydride, to slow the neutrons down, just like water. The density of hydrogen in it is better than water, so you can actually slow the neutrons down quite a bit with this system. You can get lower temperature differentials between the fuel and the propellant, again, because you're just going across the particle, and there might have been, well, there we go, it's 500 micrometers uh, in, in, uh, in size, so they're very small, small uh, particles uh, to get the heat out to the system. Uh, and high surface to volume ratio, of course, the smaller the particle, the higher that surface area is. And then it was also able to start up very rapidly. NERVA was starting up over the course of about 30 seconds at certain pressurization rates. In this case, for the particle bed reactor, they would have started up even faster. So again, minimizing the excess hydrogen uh, that you're using for propellant while you're not at your full thrust and full ISP conditions. Uh, this is another kind of figure. The Idaho National Laboratory has some reports on uh, the use of atomic power in space. And they summarize a number of the various projects over the years, including the SNTP project. And so they've come up with a few cartoons, and other folks have kind of come up with cartoons, again, showing the flow field. In this case, it would have been the flow coming in through the top, going through the moderator region, and then directly then going through the fuel. So in this case, the driving force, they would have had to have a bleed cycle coming off the nozzle a little bit to provide the driving flow for the turbine machinery. But this provided a more compact system for the reactor, although a little bit less ISP performance. Um, and this, this figure is one of the old classic figures of the particle bed uh, reactor system with the Fritz systems, uh, where they'd have a little micro machine carbon, carbon fiber uh, Fritz for it. The hot end would be a refractory or a carbon fiber Fritz. To, to contain the fuel particles, but also have flow passages that they could engineer the, the flow to match the power distribution and assign the flow to the right spots in there. Because uh, you want to make sure, if you're operating at 20 megawatts per liter or higher, you want to make sure the flow gets to where the heat is uh, and, and in a stable form. Otherwise, you'll very rapidly destroy your fuel element. Uh, so you want to make sure you get enough flow to the right regions in the core. And, and, and this arrangement allowed them to do that. But there's a lot of complex flow streams, so creating the right plenum spaces and, and whatnot for it were, were a challenge for the design team. But then also, how do you do some experiments to demonstrate that those flow fields will actually work? So Brookhaven did some tests. They did some tests in Pyle at, at Sandia uh, and, and had envisioned doing more testing uh, if the program would have continued. Uh, some of the arrangements, Mike talked a little bit about the, the general arrangement of, of the possibility of most cores are always arranged with some sort of circular pattern. Control drums are on the outside to control the system. And in this case, this would have had a 37 fuel element arrangement. You could go down to 19 elements. It would just be smaller power and lower thrust capability. You could extend the length to also increase the power, but then you have to worry about pressure drop and making sure the flow gets in. So you can scale the power level of these particle bed reactors very nicely. It's a very robust system, and like Mike talked about before, finding different robust ways of using the things to, for various applications, or another speaker talked about, don't focus in on one mission, make an application that could be very widely used for a number of things, and this is a very flexible design to use for a number of different applications. So you can build it modularly and build in different power levels or thrust levels. Uh, later ones would look at, well, how can we also use that, that reactor power if we're only thrusting for a little while? Can't we use that energy for other things? And so concepts that involve bimodal uh, concepts where you attach, when you're not thrusting, why not make electricity with your nuclear reactor? Uh, why carry along other fuel cells or solar panels or or other systems, why not, why not use that reactor to provide electricity? And so concepts were developed to, to bring along a, a Brayton system or other any sort of other energy conversion system. The Braytons tended to work the best at the highest efficiencies and lowest, people talked before, don't make your radiator so big that it ruins your vehicle mass. So having, having high reject temperatures for your radiator and developing a couple hundred kilowatts of power, what you could use for either payload 
uh, for for your crew or scientific missions. You could you could develop your your Brayton system to be whatever kilowatts that you wanted out of the system at a higher level than a than a RTG or or a, like the crusty kind of levels of one to ten kilowatts of scale. This would be more payload capability for 100 kilowatts, uh, and, and you could operate it for quite a long time. You could thrust it where you wanted to go, and then generate electricity for a number of years to do all your scientific missions. Other applications then said, okay, well, gee, we went bimodal, why not go trimodal? Uh, and in this case, they were using it to, to enhance uh, uh, the same thing with the normal propulsion, with the normal flow streams for the propulsion, uh, adding on the, uh, a Brayton system for electrical generation, but then also adding on a, a system to be a, a LOX augmented uh, kind of pre-burner or post-burner uh, combustor to add a little bit of extra kick by burning off some of the hydrogen, mixing it with oxygen, and, and kind of superheating, uh, supercharging the, the exhaust and raising the ISP even further by, by having a little bit of an extra augmentation of that ISP, uh, a non-nuclear augmentation by burning the hydrogen and, and creating an afterburner uh, for it. So that, that would have been a, now they get more and more complex, you got a lot more piping that you got to deal with and making sure your mass requirements are still met. But these were, these were notions of how you could use the particle bed reactor for, for various applications. An another application was the miniature reactor engine, which was a derivative off the particle bed. It could have used a particle bed or it would have gone to a different fuel form uh, for this, but using it as a, as a upper atmosphere uh, ramjet system, you'd use the, the reactor engine and the coolant would then be the upper atmosphere, so forming a ramjet. Uh, so you could adapt the reactor uh, to be not used for propulsion between planetary, but once you got reached the planet, you could use the system to zip around the atmosphere and, and look at different, do different scientific missions to, to investigate the upper atmosphere. Uh, so you'd replace the hydrogen with the ambient atmosphere uh, from the inlet. You'd reduce the outlet temperature because, of course, the, the atmosphere as a coolant isn't as good as the hydrogen, so you reduce your fuel temperatures. Reduce the power densities, therefore, because you couldn't get the heat out of it. And you could operate this thing just zipping around the upper atmosphere for, instead of just an hour for propulsion, you could zip around for months and, and do your experiments. Um, and it had other applications for, for the solar system and near, near interstellar exploration. Uh, the one concept was to use it to look at the Jovian atmosphere mapping to see how that looked. Uh, some aspects of where the MIDI was different than PBR is that instead of having a single pressure vessel and multiple fuel elements, in this case they created a series of, of, of multiple individual pressure tubes to feed, feed the flow through the, the fuel regions. Instead of having a single nozzle, it would have had multiple nozzles, one for each of the pressure tubes. Uh, the coated particles of the particle bed reactor evolved either using UC, UO2 particles or mixing them into some fibers and then into a metal matrix uh, uh, for, for creating a more stable, stable fuel form that could, that could operate for months instead of hours. Uh, transferring the, the heat from the fuel, fission heat to the, to the gas, uh, whether it was the packed particles or moving on to a metal matrix. Uh, and the weights, and this is where the big differences are, is that the particle bed reactor, which was already much less than a NERVA engine of, say, 2,000 kilograms, now the particle bed reactor for a 1,000 megawatt system was 500 kilograms. Now the MIDI was a small thing, uh, meant to be uh, only very, very uh, small mass, 50 kilograms, uh, one-tenth the power, uh, but still could function as, as, a, as a reactor system with that size for, for criticality. But much, looking at much lower thrust levels, because you weren't propulsing between planets, you were zipping around the atmosphere uh, for that. And, and then finally, some of the aspects of the evolution of, of nuclear thermal propulsion and rocket capabilities. In the early 50s and 60s, looking at the NERVA and rover systems, the in-flight systems planned for Mars missions, of being about 23 megawatts per liter, or really less than that. Uh, uh, that's the maximum. More likely, they were somewhere around five megawatts per liter. Anywhere from 1,000 to 500 megawatts, 
uh, using solid fuel form or ceramic based uh, composite fuel form and they had done a lot of ground tests to evolve it to then ultimately come along into the 80s and the 70s Jim was inventing it uh, Grumman was coming along to say hey we think we can make this the late 80s going along to, to make it a full project and then in the early 90s kind of completing some of the testing the physics testing and the thermal testing to say yes we really think this thing could work but then the funding ran away uh, for it uh, and interest into other other uh, space exploration and then some ideas in the early late 90s was to look at the media other applications that with the space exploration initiative uh, what sorts of other things could you use NTP for uh, and so that's where where the media parts come into into play is the evolution of going to higher and higher ISP capable m lower mass systems uh, that can let you do other things in, in the in the planetary exploration and I think that's all I had, I think I met my 20 limit, 20 minute limit there. Uh, and BWC has been involved with the space program over the years on various different projects, whether it's uh, electrical, electrical power generation with the GIMO project, SNTP involved with some of the fuel development and core development, and then some other bimodal systems. Uh, so there, you wouldn't think that BWXT is a space kind of company but we are in bits pockets when different opportunities come up for unique reactor systems that we're, we're good at uh, helping design and have partner with a lot of uh, Department of Energy folks and also the uh, industry partners uh, for the typical aerospace companies that would be the vehicle integrators and, and system integrators so with that uh, that's I, all I have on particle bed reactors Roger will have probably a better story. So. <laughs>